We're going to do things differently tonight. I'm not going to have a song leader. <laughs> Something Brad said to me a few weeks ago, and I thought, we could try that. So we're going to sing some medleys. So there'll be groups of three songs, and we'll just sing a few verses of each of the songs. So it'll all be up on the screen, all nicely set out, um, and I will play my normal introductions so that we don't get lost. So we'll finish the song, I will do my normal four-bar introduction, and then we'll start. So Azrael will be looking after the screen, so he'll be like the song leader, he'll hold the title up until I've done my introduction, and then switch over just as we're ready to start as a hint. That we're, we're ready to start singing. Um, so I've, got, I've asked a couple of the men to do some scripture reading as well. So we'll have reading, some songs. So after the first group of songs, Brad, if you can pray. And then we'll have another scripture reading. And it'll be up on the screen as well, so you guys will know when you're on. It'll be up on the screen. Then the second set of songs. And then I'll do the sermon and then we'll finish off with another little medley as well. Um, so announcement-wise, we have the card for June down the front that you can sign as a farewell sign. No, a lot of people signed on the notes instead of in the card. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah, we wanted it full of signatures, but then we gave notes and so we've got notes. So, yeah, so we've got lots of notes. Yeah, yeah. It's just so it looks occupied. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, so with the service tonight, I'm just reading through my notes. There will be times of silence. Don't freak out. Don't, um, and men, when you come up to read, don't be in a hurry to come up. Don't try and fill the silence. Let the silence be there. Okay, so... For those latecomers, we're not having a song leader tonight. We're going to sing some medleys. So that just follow the prompts up on the screen. Um, so there will be silence. Um, so make sure your phone's on silent because the last thing you want is it going beep, beep. <laughs> I haven't done mine yet because I had it on earlier. I also have. It's off. Um, so scripture readings, songs, prayer, um, normal introductions, so announcements, Wednesday prayer meeting like normal, youth group is on the 6th, which is this Friday. There's oh, what the... was this Friday now? Oh, okay. Well, that's not what the bulletin says. <laughs> we can have no... Ah, okay. I was just saying what the bulletin says. Okay, so you had it yesterday, so it's in two weeks' time. Okay, that's fine. We can live with that. Um... Had a couple of emails from Pasta. Things are going well over there. That was all. Okay, so with the medleys, I've structured them to illustrate a point about worship. You will notice that the worship is at the end of the medley because worship should be a response to a fact or a truth about God. So it starts with the truth. Often it'll be um, a fact a third person truth, a fact about God, or, or we. And the second song is, is more personalised. It's a second person truth. It's I do something or I know this. And the last one is directed to God as worship. So it illustrates that fact that worship is a response. It's something we should do in response to God. It's not something we do off the back just by ourselves. Um, so... I think it was Pastor Bill who, who said um, sometimes he wonders if we should have things around the other way, have the sermon first and have the singing, the worship singing afterwards as a response to the sermon. It's quite interesting. So I've arranged the, uh, the medleys like that. So Jason, you'll be first up with your reading. So if, if you turn to Psalm 103, both the readings come from Psalm 103, so you can leave it open on your chair while we sing. So you come up. Psalm 103, 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is, in, is within me. Bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with love kindness, loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfy the mouth, thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles.
humble ourselves in your sight. Lord, we plead for your mercy and your cleansing. Wash us, Lord, that we might be clean vessels that could honor you. be stirred, Lord, because we enter into your presence. Lord, that we'd enter your courts with praises and honor and lift you up. Lord, that our lips might praise thee. Lord, with our whole being we might honor you and we might look to you. You're worthy tonight, Lord, to be worshipped and honored and praised and glorified in everything that we do. Lord, help us not to come here and just do something religious. The Lord, let us come here and seek you with all of our heart and know you in all your fullness and all your glory. Lord, I pray you'd be lifted up tonight with the hearts of your people that we might worship you with all of our being. Guide us tonight. Psalm 103, 8 to 18. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He had not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is a high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Amen.
thank you for participating in that. So, so tonight I wanted to carry on a thought that I came across when I was preparing for a Sunday school adult class. It's <coughs> been on my mind for a while. Pastor mentioned preaching weeks ago before he left. He's very organised, very organised man. <coughs> and I came across this in studying Second Peter. And it's the, the thought of adding to your faith, growing. Decaying comes up later. I'll explain later. These are my long distance classes so that you aren't all fuzzy. That's better. But now I can't read my notes. I knew that would happen. <laughs> Horrible. Okay. Adding to your faith, growing. It's, that's the bottom line that I want to get to. But before we get there, I want to use some illustrations from life. So this morning I, I batted you with some acronyms. So the first one is T. B, A, truth, belief, action. It's a principle of life. Our actions are based on our beliefs and our beliefs are based on what we accept as truth. So by way of example, um, a kid who believes in the tooth fairy is going to take his tooth and stick it under the pillow. All right, so there's a belief and an action based on a truth in his mind that his school kids, his parents, unfortunately, have told him. Um, same principle with Santa Claus. If you believe in Santa Claus, you're going to, if you're American, put your stocking up on the fireplace when it's freezing cold. In Australia, um, for some reason, my parents did something with Santa, even though they were Christians. Um, we had a, a sack that we'd put up the end of the bed, and that was our Santa gifts. We all knew it was for mum and dad, but that was the Santa gifts. So if you believe in Santa, there's stuff that you do. Um, also, think of people who believe in aliens. If they really believe, they change their behaviour. Um, think about when you drive your car. If you believe the laws are there to be obeyed, you'll stick to the speed limit. If you believe that you can break the rules and get away with it, that's what you'll do. But if you've been caught a couple times, then your belief about getting away with it is reduced and you're less likely to speed. Yes. So a lot of our actions, if not all of them, are based on what we believe. It's a principle of life. We live it every day. But in the Christian walk, we somehow miss it. And I'll get to that to explain that. So... The principle itself is not wrong. Truth, belief, action. It's not wrong. The underlying problem is what we accept as truth. As we said, Tooth Fairy, Santa, there's, there's a truth level there that people have accepted. It's the, what we accept as truth that's the problem. So it's things that we often accept as truth, books that we read, movies that we watch, computer games that we play, TV shows that we watch, the news, scientists, statement by famous people. So they're all things that we count as truth. And then we will often change our actions based on that truth because we believe that truth. Um, so some of the... the crazy actions we end up with because of the wrong truth. Um, really good quality movies with all their special effects. Recently, a few years back, um, we watched 
Fast and Furious. It's a car movie for those of you who don't know. And it's twice in that movie where cars are going full steam ahead at each other. They bump into each other. You know, there's damage and everything. The guys get out and have a fight. To a kid, that movie is truth. What's he going to try when he's 16? <laughs> he'll have no concept that accidents cause death because he was brainwashed by the movie that there's this other truth out there that you can have accidents and, get away and walk away from it. So it's the, the level of truth. It's that thing that we accept as truth that's the problem. I think that's the same with the computer games and the whole killing concept inside those computer games. They accept that as truth, that you can kill, not feel bad about it, get killed, reset, off you go. What are those guys thinking, the young men, when they go into the school and shoot? Are they thinking, it's okay, I won't hurt anybody. It'll just reset and we'll be fine. So just be careful about what you accept as truth. And my favourite pet peeve currently is go on TV to fall in love. Oh, yeah. that's, that's the truth that they're pushing. If you want to find true love, go on a TV show. By the way, there is nothing real about any reality TV show. There is nothing real about anything inside a movie. It's all constructed to communicate something. Everything. Even the live shows. It's, it's scripted. It's constructed. Um, I try to remind myself of that by watching the extras when I have movies. I always go and watch the extras. Watch how they did it. Why they did it. To remind myself that it's not real. It's just entertainment. And sometimes what we accept as truth is dependent upon how it's presented. I'm buying a car this week for the church. Looking at the web page, I found two cars. They're both dealer cars, because I decided we wanted to trade it in, so I looked at dealer cars. Two very nice cars. Contacted both of them. They came back with an address. And the address for one of them was in the middle of the canals on the Gold Coast. And then I spoke to him, and he'd been in the industry for 50 years, and rah, rah, rah. It's like, yeah, OK. Then the other car, the details came back as a dealership in Browns Plains. My first thought was, I don't believe the guy who's selling it out of his house, because it's not presented well. And it's the same with, sometimes you get car yards down here on Webster Road. You wouldn't buy a car from that car yard. Because no. it doesn't present right. You wouldn't accept what he says is truth. Um, so we need to be careful about that presentation error that we can make when things are presented to us. Just because a man in a white coat who says he's a scientist says something doesn't make it truth. Okay. Um, same with movies. You go back and watch the older movies and you say, wow, that's so unbelievable, special effects. <laughs> and you watch a modern movie and you get sucked in because it's presented really well. So be careful about measuring truth by how it's presented. So as children, we, we start living by this TBA principle, this truth, belief, action principle. Our actions are based on our beliefs. As a child, I was taught about um, respecting those in authority, adults. So it was Mr. and Mrs. or auntie and uncle, never first names, ever. That was the, my belief system based on the, the truth of, that my parents showed me. Um, so my actions were controlled by that belief, even as a teenager, as a middle teenager, and after we got married, as a teenager, we were 18, um, we were counted as adults. We, both of us, still talked to all of the P 
people we had ever talked to as Mr. and Mrs. as Mr. and Mrs. We never used their first name. Um, all of our school teachers, we worked in the school with our teachers. It was always Mr. and Mrs. That's our actions were governed by our beliefs. And it's the same with the tooth fairy. Their actions are governed by that belief. But as you grow, you need to go back and reevaluate that belief system and see whether that truth is a valid truth. And if you don't go back, you end up behaving like a child still because you haven't reevaluated that belief and that truth. Um, and you, you find that with 20 year olds, in their t guys in their 20s, who are still behaving like children. They haven't reassessed their childlike beliefs as an adult. You need to go back and revisit those. So as, as you grow, you become picky about what you consider a source of truth. The, the main thing we need to consider as a source of truth, of course, is the Bible. Because it is truth. It's, it's what it, it contains everything we need to know in order to be saved and to live a holy Christian life. And if you're not considering this as truth, then are you saved? Are you living a Christian life if you're not referring to this as truth? <coughs> Believing it and changing your actions. That, that growth, that adding concept. So as a Christian, we need to change the TBA proof in truth into a BFA, a Bible faith action principle. So we're not just believing any truth, we're believing Bible truth. We're believing it and we're putting it into action. So Bible faith action. So as a human being, the first Bible truth that you need to get your head around to accept to acknowledge, to know of, and that's why we share the gospel, is the gospel. People need to know about the gospel as a truth, and then they can respond to it in belief, in faith. Um, Hebrews 11.6 is a, a verse that's been close to me recently. It clicked. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you're going to come to God as an unsaved person, to come to God, two things you have to understand. God exists and he's a rewarder. If you seek him, you will find him. That's the first step towards salvation in my mind. He exists and he is a rewarder. <coughs> So my little catchphrase from that is, God is a rewarder, not a revenger. Because most of the world think of God as vindictive, as out to get us. When in fact, he's out to save us, to redeem us, to help us. And that change of attitude is that first step towards salvation. So let's all turn to Romans chapter 3 while I change glasses. And you're all fuzzy now. Romans chapter 3, and we'll read a couple of verses there about some truths we need to understand in order to be saved. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and we'll start reading at verse 10. And we'll go down through to 18. So this is God's description of humankind. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is in their lips. 
whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's God's assessment of mankind. A lot of people will say, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as... That's not the point. Comparing yourselves among yourselves is, is not the point. It's not clever. The point is, who are you in God's eyes? Are you prepared to believe that you're a sinner, to accept that truth and apply it in your own life? Um, we all know John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's that rewarder concept I spoke about from Hebrews. He is a rewarder of those that seek him. He loved, he gave, Jesus died. We believe we receive eternal life. He's a rewarder. Also in Romans 3, jump down to verse 21. We can see again this concept of God being a rewarder. He's willing to redeem. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. So again, redemption, forgiveness, righteousness is available. God sees us as sinners, but he's willing to give us righteousness. He's a rewarder. Um, and that last verse 26, the, the plan of salvation allows God to be just and a justifier. He can be holy and right as well as forgive sin. All the other versions of salvation of the gospel where we work for it, doesn't allow God to do those two things at the same time. Okay, the plan of salvation, the gift of salvation, allows God to be just and the justifier. So there's some biblical truths that an unsaved person needs to hear. That's why it's our job to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, challenge people about God's existence, about their sin. They need to hear these things. Then they can evaluate for themselves whether they think it's truth and believe. When they believe, there's actions that result, that principle we've, talk, we've been talking about. So some of the actions are repentance. It's a change of thinking. It's a change of mind. Instead of saying, I'm not that bad, they'd be saying, I am a sinner. I am separated from God. I need to be reconciled. Then there's the acknowledgement, Jesus has paid for my sin. And that forgiveness is available. And it's acknowledging that God is a rewarder. God will respond to my faith by forgiving, justifying, declaring righteous, and then indwelling with the Holy Spirit. Again in Romans, over a chap couple chapters to chapter 10, we can see this, this action concept, believe resulting in action, illustrated. Romans 10, 8 
through 11. So we're coming in the middle of a discussion in, in verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And verse 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So Romans talks about believing and confessing with your mouth proclaiming that you are saved, proclaiming that you accept Jesus as your saviour because you're a sinner, proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, like Peter. So there's an action that results from that belief. And of course, that's just the first one. There's other things that, that show that you truly believe. Um, there are common things that we encourage people to do, pray the sinner's prayer, walk the aisle, get some counsel. But the key thing is that it's, it's verbal and it's public. If you believe, you're not ashamed, as it says here. And it's a public confession of Christ. Um, and then witnessing as a result comes of that. And then the normal steps of obedience, baptism, church attendance, growth. The main point of the sermon, adding to your faith, growing. So that's the first Bible truth that as humans we need to accept as truth, believe and change our actions on. Once we're saved, and I'd have to say a majority of us here are saved, then the next Bible truth to believe and start acting on is that our current thinking is wrong. We need to renew our mind. We need to accept that we need to go through a re-education process. We need to expose ourselves to God's truth because the truth we've been living by may not line up with what God's word says. That's the second thing we need to get our head around. Um, so the, the Bible term is uh, renewing your mind. So we're in Romans, so just over a couple of pages to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here we're told to renew our mind, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change thinking, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So if you want to know what God says, renew your mind. Go back, assess the truths that you've been living by and say, mm, yeah, that lines up with scripture, that's okay. That one doesn't line up with scripture. It actually says this. I believe that, therefore my actions will change. Um, so some of the things that you can do to start this renewal process, the most simple, important one is reading the Bible, isn't it? Reading the Bible every day is ideal. Um, other things you can do, attend church, take notes in church, remember things from church. Um, as by way of personal testimony, I try to take notice of phrases that my pastor uses regularly. So I've got a little brief church history here from the pastors, their key, little key phrases. One I, rem one I remembered 
and forgot to write down was as a teenager we had an Irish preacher. And he, one thing I used to remember him always saying, we're going to have a look at Luke. A look at Luke because of the way they said it. It's just one of the things. There's other ones more spiritual that I'm sure that they didn't come to mind tonight. Um, Pastor Zim, we were um, at LifeGate for nearly 10 years and one of his catchphrases was, life is a series of choices. I internalised that by adding, and their consequences. We can't choose the consequences, but we can make the choice. Uh, Pastor Marsman, who was here before Pastor Bramblett, his, famous, his saying that I took and personalised was his definition of faith. Taking God at his word and acting upon it. Faith results in action. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate tonight with that BFA, Bible, faith, action. Taking God at his word. That's always our starting point for faith and acting upon it. And then Pastor Bramblett's the one I've latched on is, there's only one God and you're not him. <laughs> yes, great one. I like that one. So there are things you can do to renew your mind. Little catchphrases, taking notes, reading scripture is the simplest. Studying scripture would be the next step. Come to adult Sunday school class, study it with others. Things that you can do. Um, Ephesians talks about renewing your mind as well. It talks about putting off and putting on. There are things that we have to put off. Stop doing, stop believing. Other things that we have to start believing and start doing. So it's a, it's a two-step process, putting off and putting on. All right, so by way of illustration, we're going to look at a few Bible principles that may well be contrary to, to stuff that you believe or hold as truth just as a, a challenge point. If I step on toes, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the first one is the concept of an eye for an eye, the revenge concept. Kids love it. He hit me first. As adults, we're not necessarily in much better. Okay, so that truth that it's okay to hit back, to get revenge, to hold a grudge and make sure you make them pay later. That's a truth and a belief that we often live by. But is it biblical? So the skeptic will first say, yeah, but it's a Bible term. Yeah, it is. It's about five or six times an eye for an eye is used. And in each instance, every single one of them, it's instructions to the court system, Israel's court system. When something bad has happened and they're pulled before the judges, this is the standard. That's where it's used. Um, so the examples I found is um, hurting a woman with child. If a mischief follows after hurting a woman with the child, then the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is mentioned. If you hurt your servant when you're correcting them, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, same thing. The master is not exempt. Um, same with hurting a neighbour and also being a false witness. If you're caught out being a false witness and the point of your false witness was to get someone to go to jail, the eye for an eye principle comes in place and you end up in jail. That's the only instances where that principle is used in scripture. Other places, we're in Romans 12, amazing, we're staying in Romans. Romans 12, uh, 14 through 19 is an illustration of the biblical truth that's contrary. This is the truth we need to understand, believe and act upon. Romans 12, 14 through 19. Bless them which persecute you. 
bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil, providing things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto the wrath. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. When I was working in youth group, one of the things I said to the children, who, because pastor's kids were all self-righteous and telling off the other kids, and I'd say, that's not your job. Revenge, avenge, vengeance is not your job. It's God's job. That's the Bible truth. Do you accept it as truth? Are you acting on that? Have you changed your actions because of that truth? First um, Peter 3, 8 and 9 also covers that truth for those taking notes. Uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter 26 for the next one. This is one I came across as a teenager and I've tried to live by this principle. Proverbs 26, 18 and 19. As a madman who casts firebrands, arrows and death, so is the man that deceives his neighbour and says, am not I in sport? I was only joking. After tearing strips off them, embarrassing them in front of everybody, telling a lie about them for the sake of humour. Am not I in sport? Proverbs says you're just like a man who is throwing firebrands and arrows and death. Right. So to me, the truth, the principle is lying for fun is not appropriate. Full stop. You believe it, what about your actions? Um, Ephesians 5 mentions a similar thing. Somewhere in here. Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 3 and 4. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Okay, so watch the foolish talking, the jesting, the, the teasing with the intent of hurting. Okay, so simple Bible truths that we need to believe and put into practice. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This one currently hardly anybody believes because they certainly don't practice the result of this belief. The truth is fornication is not okay, ever. Sex outside of marriage is not allowed. Full stop. That's the Bible truth. But very few Christians even practice that. They'll make some excuse as to why they think they can have sex outside of a committed marriage relationship. So 1 Corinthians 6 explains that and why it's so important. 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot, God forbid. What? Know ye not that 
he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The importance of not committing fornication for a Christian is that truth that we are the body of Christ. We are in Christ. We are one with Christ. If we take us and join ourselves in sexual relations with somebody else, Ephesians, Galatians and Genesis talks about leaving a father and mother and they two shall be one, one flesh. Sexual relations makes you one. Spiritual relationship between you and Christ makes you one with Christ. If you then do it outside of marriage, you've broken that picture. That's why it's so important that the oneness of a husband and wife, the one body, the one flesh of a husband and wife pictures the oneness we have with Christ. It's why it's so important that as Christians we don't break that picture. A less serious one for most of us. I think there's only one poor guy who I'm going to pick on. Obey your parents. <laughs> Simple Bible truth. <laughs> Simple Bible truth that we need to believe and change our actions on. For us as adults, it comes back to honouring and respecting our parents. Ephesians 6 talks about that. One of the commandments in Exodus 20 is a reflection of that. So we're in the New Testament, so let's stay there and go to Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Okay, so Ash... There's a principle, but there's a reward as well. Notice that? It says, Obey your parents, that it may go well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. So there's blessings for obeying. Those who disobey end up in trouble, and they go outside of the umbrella of the protection of the family because they've rebelled. And out there is not a safe place. So, on your parents, uh, respect and honour is for us as adults. Using Mr and Mrs is that respect thing. It's just showing that little bit of respect for people. Um, sadly, family treat each other the worst. We don't treat our loved ones as well as we treat a stranger sometimes because we're familiar. We know where their buttons are and we like to push them. Um, but the instructions are to love. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself. That chapter in Ephesians talks about the body, because that's the picture where the body of Christ, we're in Christ. And it says, no man ever yet hated his own body. So you should love your wife the same way that you love yourself. And I'm sure most of us men have a high opinion of ourselves. But we don't always reflect that in our relationship with our wife. So obey your parents, honour your parents. Um, and which one's what I want to hit? All right, we can quickly do those two. Let's go to um, Proverbs 18. So back to the book of Proverbs where you'll find a lot of gems a lot of little rules that you can memorise, believe, and then put into practice. Proverbs chapter 18. Verse 
Proverbs 18, verse 13. He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. And 1727, he that has knowledge bears his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. So it's the hold your tongue principle. These are just two examples. There are plenty of others where we're encouraged to think before we speak, to hold your tongue, to get all the facts. It's a, it's a Bible truth. You need to make sure you believe it and start acting it. Don't go like I did as a young man, went further, too far and didn't speak at all. You just do have to talk, but just do it cautiously. Don't jump in. And then the last one, we're in Proverbs, Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, 1. A wise son hears his father's instructions, but a scorner hears not rebuke. Other verses, the biblical truth is be accepting of rebuke. Accept that you will do wrong and someone will have to correct you. And have a, an attitude of accepting that correction. It's a biblical truth. Are you practicing it? Um, something else to note humanism, which is what almost every what he believes these days is that mankind is king, mankind is God, or our own God. And it's borne out by their religion of evolution that change is consistent, change is necessary, change is good. The only problem is the change they're talking about, that they paint pretty, is actually decay. Their change that makes evolution happen is actually decay, it's a loss of information. For a Christian, it's not decay change that we're looking for. It's growth change that we're looking for. Yes, we need to change, but it's changing towards what God wants us to do. It's growth. And like I said, Second Peter, we've been, we looked at that this morning in Sunday school, about adding to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, and charity things that we can add to our faith. It's a growth process. And one of the catchphrases is, if you stand in still, you're probably going backwards. It's, it's a growth process. You need to study, you need to read, you need to attend church in order to grow. So the challenge is, take that life principle you've been living by, truth, belief, action, turn it around, Focus more on Bible truth, belief, and action, and judge your actions by what you believe and what the Bible says. It's the Bible is truth, and if your actions don't line up, then your beliefs are probably wrong. Go find out what they should be. Believe it, then you can put it into action. Okay, um, we're going to sing another medley now to finish off. And it talks a, a little bit about this growth process. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is the scripture reading for it. I came across this passage in preparation for 2 Peter teaching. Um, 2 Peter talks about um, having received great and precious promises that we might be partakers of his nature. And in one of the cross references is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Where am I? Yep, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The cross reference is actually chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises, and as I keep saying in Sunday school, there's a key word there. Therefore, it's a why is it there? Let's go back and find out. So let's go back to verse 18 of chapter 6. No, we need to go back further. Um, 16. Yep, wrote it down wrongly. Up there. 16. 
Okay, so starting at verse 16, this gives us the context. Again, it talks, the, the paragraph is talking about being unequally yoked. Um, and so we're coming into that, uh, that point. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said. And these are the promises that are referred to in verse 7. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Almighty. Having therefore these promises, these things that God has just said about him being our father, forgiving us, dwelling with us, the encouragement to come out and be separate, to be holy. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Change, growth, getting away from what we used to be, moving closer to what God wants us to be. And that's what these, these three songs talk about.
でしょう Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can call you Father, that you have promised to make us your children and to dwell with us and to, to be with us for eternity. We thank you that we have your word in our own language that we can read and understand. Thank you that we have the Holy Spirit that can guide us into all truth. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us and that each of us would determine to spend time, more time in your word, finding those truths that we need to believe and to apply in our lives. We pray for safety as we depart and um, pray for your blessings on June and her family and commit that situation to you. Pray for you to be honoured and glorified. Um, help us to know how best to minister to this family during this time of need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.